Uh, next in the panel, uh, the panel will be moderated by Dr. Michael Young. Uh, he's the Associate Director for Environmental Systems at the Bureau of Economic <coughs> Geology here at UT Austin. There he leads a broad-based group of about 30 research scientists and engineers focusing on the water energy nexus, water resource evaluation, <coughs> groundwater recharge processes, energy economics, coastal processes, and geological mapping. His personal research interests include uh, and experience include the movement of water and solutes in arid and semi-arid bed zones, soil water plant interactions, groundwater recharge, and the connection between water resources. Dr. Young. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of uh, a couple of program notes. I've asked the Tamas people to bring in uh, cookies <laughs> for all people who are brave enough to stick it out to the end to the last bit of the. So hopefully they will be coming in here. And and uh, I want to uh, just sort of give a couple of my, um, my kind of thoughts on the really great presentations that, um, that I heard earlier today. And the first one, and probably most important, is to not forget about UTEP and Texas Tech. <laughs> Kept coming up again and again. And um, the second is really that, 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 that the issues that Texas is facing in terms of water requires industry, requires academia, requires government, requires the stakeholders. This, this is not a problem that can be solved um, by one group working in isolation. If we're really looking at six to seven million acre feet a year of shortage by 2060, we have to either create water out of thin air or we have to somehow improve the basic infrastructure and the systems that we're using so that water can be where the people are living across the state. So this is gonna require something that's it's gonna take time to implement, but at the same time, uh, it's vitally important to avoid things like mass migrations of people across the state. Um, the second is that there's really a, a tremendous connection between the needs, between needs and technology. So there's, there's obviously a lot of technological um, discussion today in terms of, uh, in terms of the internet, uh, in terms of all the desal that's going on in, in San Antonio and El Paso. Uh, and, and as well, there's been, a, there's been a lot of engagement in the state as well with Senate bills one, two, and three. And, it's those kinds of, those kinds of activities that will, that will have a connection between what we can do technologically and what we're allowed to do legally. And it's these kinds of things that will help us um, to really kind of make it for the next uh, 50 years. And then, um, and then finally, um, it's really an all of the above approach for all the different types of water. There's surface water, groundwater, there's reuse, there's aquifer storage and recovery, there's conservation, all of these things um, are going to be needed in order to, to make it uh, to 22 million acre feet a year was what is what the current projections are, and so um, the presentations they have been have really gone across all of these different these different areas of sort of the water world in Texas, and we're very fortunate to have a representative from government, stakeholder groups, academia, and the research community as our final panelist to go through the um, to, to go through their thoughts and to discuss with you and. I have a series of questions um, that I've posed to them, but at the same time, this is really about your questions that we can try to finalize, finish this up. So if everybody is either asleep or too tired, then I will point out people and have you ask questions. I already know my first person who's eating a large cookie right over there, the gentleman over there. Uh, and so let me introduce the panelists very quickly. Uh, Jorge Arroyo is the Director of Innovative Water Technologies at Texas Water Development Board. Stacy Steinbach is the executive director of the Texas Alliance of Groundwater Districts. Uh, Michael Weber is associate director of the Center for International Energy and Environmental Policy and co-director of the Clean Energy Incubator at UT Austin. And finally, Kent Zamet from uh, Electric Power Research Institute. He is a senior program manager of environment at, at EPRI. And um, rather than have the panelists come up here and, we're, and, and do that, we're, I'm just gonna hand them the the controller, and then they're just going to hand it off. So we'll have collaboration across all the different sectors at the same time that we're using technology. We'll see how that. Let's we'll see if this works. We can fight over it. Since I only have one slide, I hate to screw it up. I think everything has been said, so I'm going to be very brief. Um, I want us to start with a, a, a fable, one of Aesop's fables. The, uh, you might have uh, heard of this. A crow is thirsty, finds a pitcher with water, 
but cannot reach the water. So very creative, starts picking up little pebbles and putting them in the pitcher until the water level rises and the crow can finally get to the water. I know Des is probably already thinking about some of the engineering issues associated with this. That is not going to work every time, but bear with me. <laughs> so the, the moral of the fable, the moral of the, the story here of Aesop's fable is that need is the mother of innovation. I believe that the water world is exploding with innovation. We see it in uh, membranes, of course, over the last 10 years in particular, maybe 15. But we also see it in some of the policies and some of the management approaches that are being used to deal with our water issues. We also see a lot of innovation in data management, acquiring data, uh, being able to monitor what is in the water, being able to model the aquifers, the resources, et cetera. So there is a lot of innovation in that area too. The other point that I wanted to make on this slide is, that has already been expressed uh, uh, earlier, this, uh, this uh, slide, this pie is the, uh, represents the 2060 water supplies that are gonna be cumulative, cumulatively developed over the next 50 years if the state water plan is implemented. So you see that one of the attributes of this uh, supply is gonna be the diversity and the composition of the different sources that are gonna be tapped. So that's one thing where we also see creativity uh, as a result of need. We are diversifying and diversity itself is an asset, a desirable asset. Uh, all sources count, all sources are tapped. Even those that we used to think as impaired sources are now an important component to the water supply portfolio. Also, part of this uh, composition is uh, conservation. And this is another area that has evolved substantially, particularly the last, uh, since the new uh, rules for the state water planning have been uh, established in the state. That, that discourse has evolved to where now uh, setting targets are, is more reasonable as part of the conversation. So, like many other places around the world, Texas is, is not exactly running out of water, but we see the horizon on the, the availability that we have. We are seeing how vulnerable some of those sources might be and how a bigger event could really put us into a very difficult situation. Somebody referred earlier to the buffer uh, between demand and supply, how that has shrank, and so uh, maybe the drought or record is not even a good measure. Maybe uh, we, are, we are vulnerable to even shorter droughts. So uh, because we, we can see that vulnerability of that water supply portfolio, we begin to think about what is next and what actions do we need to take today so that 50 years down the line, we are gonna have a situation not, not just of sufficient water supplies, but of abundance. The kind of abundance that triggers or attracts economic growth. You know, there's gonna be 10 billion people pretty short here. It's not just about having water, but having a robust water supply portfolio. And a lot of that is gonna come from uh, new sources that are tapped to, thanks to technology. The, um, the previous speaker referred to some of the technical challenges in the area of uh, uh, particular desalination. Um, so I'm not gonna go into those. But I think one of the main challenges that we have in Texas has to do with, perhaps a good way to, to put it is, if you don't like the weather, just wait a little bit because it's gonna change. Well, that is really a bummer for us here because we are at the mercy of that. We are, we are the, uh, at, the, at the whim of uh, what the climate is gonna do in terms of what kind of support are we gonna have for implementing water development policies. Um, unfortunately, a drought gives us room to look at some of, the, some of those more creative, uh, necessary things, but then it rains and we're backtracked. So, uh, we also heard about what, um, what approaches have been taken in other places in the world, like in Australia. 
I was at a meeting recently with the head of the desalination program in Sydney, and she was saying how they were uh, trying to postpone the building of the desalination plant up until the last minute. In their case, basically, they said, we knew that when our reservoirs got to 30% capacity, at the rate they were going, it was just gonna give us enough time to build the seawater desalination plant, and that's what they did. They said, we knew it was gonna be more expensive, but we were gonna try and avoid investing one and a half billion dollars if we could. So, those kind of triggers, I don't think we necessarily have it here in Texas. You know, it's a, it's a creeping drought, and then it rains again, and we, my time is up. Um, <laughs> So I think <laughs> the, the challenge that we have is, is not so much technical because we just need to invest in the research and it gets taken care of. The challenge is with adopting some of those new things, helping communities address the risk of incorporating new technologies into their, into their water supply portfolios. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Stacy Steinbach. I'm with the Texas Alliance of Groundwater Districts. For those of y'all that are not familiar with TAG, we are um, essentially a 501c3 trade association of groundwater districts and associate members in the state of Texas. And I see some of our members in the audience today. Um, TAG's president, Kathy Turner-Jones, is over there. She's the uh, general manager of Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District in um, Montgomery County. But when I, when I started thinking about this topic of water security and groundwater conservation districts and new water, and I kind of panicked when I, when I heard that we had a, such a short time frame because we all know that lawyers are incapable of doing anything in three to five minutes or in just one page. So I'm gonna to try to stick to these questions, which I think are a really good starting point for the discussion so that then we can go to the questions um, and answer session, which I think will be the most beneficial part of, of this panel. The first question, I know this group, group is very familiar, but what is a groundwater conservation district? I think that there is a, is a confusion among the general public about WCIDs, GMAs, regional water planning groups, MUDs, municipal water, and GCDs. And so wh what is a GCD? That's, that's an entity that's created by the legislature. They're like counties in that regard in that they only have the powers that the legislature grants to them. What don't they do? They don't provide water and wastewater treatment. They don't generally provide municipal water. And, and they don't own groundwater. And that's a really important distinction that I think as we've been talking about groundwater ownership, in the media and at the legislature and obviously at the, at the courts, um, you know, the public is, is, is sometimes confused about that distinction. So what do groundwater districts do? They adopt regulations that are aimed to balance private property interests and they, you know, in doing that, they consider supply and demand, long-term conservation of the aquifer and current uses. And I think, again, that's an important distinction because groundwater conservation districts were originally created, for one of the reasons they were originally created was to protect private property rights. We heard Dr. Kaiser say this morning that in areas without a groundwater conservation district, the rule of capture is the rule of law. And unless you're the guy with the biggest pump, the rule of capture is not that landowner friendly. And so groundwater districts come in and kind of level the playing field. They provide that balance to protect all interests. Um, the second question, how do groundwater districts manage groundwater? At, at its most simplest level, I could, I could spend an hour on this, but they obviously have their local regulations that they use looking at local control, local um, resources, local uses. But then on a broader scale, we have joint planning, which Dr. Kaiser also mentioned this morning. Um, there are GMAs, groundwater management areas, and those are groundwater districts kind of developed along aquifer boundaries. And they get together and create desired future conditions, that's another um, acronym, where um, those are basically saying what, it's a, it's a metric for what the, the aquifer will look like at a certain time in the future. And then those groundwater conservation districts take those DFCs created at the GMA level and implement those into their local policies. And that's how they get the regional look at a local level. So what role does groundwater play? Y'all have heard a lot today, some really great um, talks about desal and aquifer storage and recovery. Obviously, different parts of the state will do better with different um, types of new technologies and groundwater um, management. but. I think when we look at what role groundwater districts play in that water security, in 2008, 85% of all reported groundwater use occurred within the boundaries of a groundwater conservation district. And that's a really important statistic when you think about the, the most immediate benefit that groundwater districts can do in the water security field, and that is provide information and help in expanding research opportunities and help with outreach. And that's, that's the most immediate thing that, that they can do. 
Um, 73% of groundwater districts reported an increase in permit applications during the drought last year. That was from a survey we did of TAG districts. And so, you know, that information right there, we wouldn't have in areas without a groundwater conservation district. So obviously information is, is the key. We've also got districts that are doing all kinds of things across the state. Um, some districts are studying brackish um, aquifers to determine opportunities there. Other districts are partnering in collaborative efforts with counties and municipalities to do desalination. I know uh, Mitchell County is an example of that. So, you know, the last question of how can we move towards greater groundwater security, I think if I had the answer to that, I'd be really wealthy. But um, ultimately, as we, as we talk about um, regulatory certainty, then we can get more groundwater security. And I think as, as that field evolves and as we talk about more collaborative approaches and as these great scientists that are all here come up with a new technology that, that will get to a better place. That's all I've got. You're last, right, Kent? Yeah. Okay, I'm next. And you have 30 seconds left. All well, you need is from my time. There you yeah. go. You yeah. can have it. All right. Energy for water. Okay, so today's May 21st. That is my wife's birthday. That's very important because if I do not remember, the reason is relevant to you, if I do not remember, I will be in a lot of hot water. So we, it's important not just for humanity, but also for love and relationships as well, the water form. <laughs> I also like to acknowledge that Stacy and I obviously care a lot more about water than everyone else. We brought our own water bottles, so we it's not mine. we are the <laughs> the noble conservationists here. Kent Kent's like it was forced on me. I didn't have to. Take it. Okay, I'm going to say uh, everything you've heard today is something I'm going to say, uh, but I haven't said it yet. So I'm just going to repeat what other people have talked about, which is the amount of energy we need for water. So I approach this as an engineer from the energy side. I've had to learn my way through water. In this table shown here on the slides shows the amount of energy on average across the nation we need for different forms of water treatment and wastewater treatment. And we see that for surface water, we need a, on average across the nation about 1,400 kilowatt hours per million gallons to uh, collect, convey, treat, and distribute the water to our end systems. And that's a national average. The variability is quite large across the nation. In New York City, where the water is roughly clean at the source and is gravity fed, it's approximately zero. In Austin, it's about 3,500 kilowatt hours per million gallons. And then in San Diego, it's about 10,000 kilowatt hours per million gallons because that water has moved across a couple of mountain ranges across the state. So there's great variability in this number. In it, you need more energy, you have to raise the water up uh, to higher altitude from the ground, from the aquifers. Uh, you have to spend more energy if it's brackish or saline. And the ranges there show you some of the complexity in this that you heard from the prior lectures about how much um, science goes into the treatment, but it's also a lot of money and a lot of carbon and a lot of energy. If you get to a place like San Diego where the incremental gallon is something like 10,000 or more kilowatt hours per million gallons to move it across the state, all of a sudden desalination looks like a pretty good option because it might be less, uh, less energy. If you take the energy to treat the surface water or groundwater, and then you take the energy to treat the wastewater, and then you take the energy to treat that wastewater again, it's still less than a lot of brackish and, and desalination sources you might consider. So this variability is sort of interesting for us to keep in mind that we spend a lot of energy on water and we might have other options to pursue as we consider where the next gallon or the marginal gallon comes from. What I did not list here is conservation, which is often cheaper, uh, at least in terms of upfront costs and in terms of energy and CO2. So we have a range of values to keep in mind. The water retreatment and uh, reclaimed water that we might then drink for direct potable use freaks a lot of people out. Even though we do it through the systems, through the aquifer and the rivers already, we drink other people's wastewater quite often. Um, I can't remember, is it the, the Rhine in Germany, people say, has been drunk by seven people before it hits the North Sea, some number like that, right? So we do this a lot, and they, they do it on the International Space Station, where water is too precious to allow it to go to waste, so it's retreated and, and turned into drinking water on site from perspiration and, and urine and washing hands and things like that. The water is too expensive to lift to space. So when you have a price tag that's quite high next to it, you'll find a way to drink your wastewater, and Singapore does this a lot, as we heard earlier. So we have some options. There's a lot of variability from the energy and carbon environmental perspective about some of the options. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing I want to show you is this chart here coming out in a peer-reviewed journal in about three weeks. This is a, a tally we did of the amount of energy spent on water in the U.S. water system um, nationally. And it had to be a big number. More than 12 percent of U.S. energy consumption is for the water system, to heat, treat, move, pressurize, chill water, then to treat it to dispose of it again. And oftentimes that's to make it into steam for steam services. That's just for the direct water and direct steam services. If we add in the indirect steam services, for example, for power generation, that's another 33% on top of it. 33% of our nation's energy goes just to boiling water to make power. 
So if you add up that 33% with a 12% here, 45% or about half of our energy in the nation goes to water in one form or another, which matches up with what you're about to hear from, from Zamet about the amount of water we're gonna use for energy, which is about half, which is sort of interesting. About half our water goes for energy, about half our energy goes for water. This complicated flow diagram shows the fuels on the left um, going across to the right, and there's thicknesses of arrows that show how much energy we use of each fuel type, the fuel types being coal, natural gas, nuclear, solar, that kind of thing, and their end uses. I know it's hard to see, but we'll make the slides available to you. A lot of the energy goes to electricity generation because we use electricity for a lot of our water heating and treatment and pressurizing, that kind of thing. And a lot of the water is used directly on site to boil water or to make steam. And we have overall this 12% number, about 7% of it is rejected as waste energy and the rest is actually going to, wa uh, to water services. What's interesting here is how many quads of energy or how much percent of our national energy consumption is just for heating water, which we could do with solar, thermal, and other applications that don't need to consume the, the primary fossil fuels. So we have some opportunities here to either get the water into the form we want with a different form of energy, or perhaps look for opportunities for conservation and savings. The good news of this is that energy conservation and water conservation are synonymous. In fact, saving energy save so much water, it might be the cheapest way to save water, is to save energy, and vice versa. If you wish to save energy, save water. If you wish to save water, save energy. So there's a good news story there from a conservation angle. And that's all I have to say. I mean, that's, that's all I have to say now. I've got more to say later. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the water reuse and seven, you being reused seven times. There's a film clip, or film coming out shortly by uh, uh, group on reclaimed water and selling the idea of reclaimed water and it stars a uh, world-renowned scientist and part-time comedian named Jack Black and he talks about uh, the uh, water he's trying to sell the idea of re-drinking water wastewater and he talks about it coming from the uh, porcelain springs so <laughs> you guys want to remember that it's a great way to advertise it um i want to talk a little bit about uh, water use in power plants is something i've been working on for a lot my entire career actually in the utility industry for over 30 years um, Utilities are just one stakeholder in the water picture, but they're a very important stakeholder because of the large amount of water that they withdraw. Um, and we have, because of things like risk to capital, uh, more and more our members are sponsoring research because they realize when they put a plant on the ground for 30, 40 years, they have to be able to operate that plant for the full life of that plant or they risk the capital invested in that plant. So water conservation options are really important to our industry and something that we're doing a lot of research on. Um, and I just put in some charts. These will be available, so I'm not gonna go in great detail, but this is 1995 USGS data on water withdrawals, and I'll emphasize withdrawal. This is, uh, includes water that's pulled out of a surface water system used to cool a power plant and then return to that surface water system. Um, and if you look at this uh, chart, you can see that the, oops, wrong button. The thermoelectric use is 38, 39%. Irrigation is roughly the same, 39%. So equivalent, roughly equivalent. This is 95 data. We don't have USGS data for consumption uh, for 2000 and 2005. They're working on that right now, so we'll have uh, updated data shortly. But if you look at consumption, in other words, what, how much water is actually consumed in thermoelectric generation, you get the next chart, which shows that the thermoelectric uh, use drops to 3%. The reason being for once through cooling, uh, less than uh, uh, two or 3% of that water is actually consumed. And that water is consumed because uh, the thermal plume has a higher differential evaporation rate than the water that's in the surface system. Um, if you look at cooling towers, cooling towers will essentially double the consumption of water if you retrofit cooling towers to an existing once through cool power plant. And that's because all of, the, all of the heat has to be rejected by evaporating water in a cooling tower, whereas on a thermal plume, some of that heat is rejected through convective means and also radiation, a uh, small amount to geothermal. Um, if you look at this chart, this is one of my favorite charts, and keep it handy, because it, it looks at power, uh, our water consumption, water intensity by fuel type. You can see on the left-hand side here, the, the columns are uh, nuclear, coal, oil, and gas, and those are all simple cycle plants. 
you can see they're all relatively the same um, uh, amount of water used, and the majority of that water is used for cooling. That's the light blue uh, part of the line. Um, these are for plants that run cooling towers, and these are based on national averages. Um, what's really important to see is that on a combined cycle plant, which is this middle, middle chart, this pointer is not very bright, this is combined cycle. The combined cycle plant inherently uses about one-third of the water of a, a traditional simple cycle plant, and that's because about two-thirds of the power is generated by a Brayton cycle, a combustion turbine, which uses virtually no cooling water. Um, and therefore you use about one-third of the water that you would otherwise use. Um, I would also mention that solar thermal and uh, in integrated gasification combined cycle, both of those use quite a bit of water. Combined, uh, gasification combined cycle has extra water uh, because of the cooling demands for the air separation unit. And then biofuels, they have the same water requirement as any other simple cycle plant. And in fact, if you have to irrigate the biofuel itself, um, you have additional water. That does not include irrigation of the fuel itself. Uh, so keep that chart handy. Another point I want to make is that over the last couple of decades, the utility industry's uh, water intensity has been going down. And that trend will continue. Again, with the adoption of natural gas combined cycle plants, it's much easier with new plants to adopt cooling technologies. Uh, a lot of people talk about retrofitting dry cooling to existing plants. That's economically virtually impossible. Uh, with the amount of retrofit, uh, the amount of modifications you'd have to make to the rest of the balance of plant, it'd be easier just to basically scrap that plant and start over. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of things that are happening, use of degraded water sources, other things that are driving down the water intensity uh, for the power industry. Uh, the, the hope is that with the retirement of old plants and integration of new plants, integration of water conserving technologies with those new plants, that line will continue to go down. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs>